at a techn technological improvement here on the sound system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. That was excellent. And actually, I was also a, a legal observer for the National Lawyers Guild during the Occupy Wall Street movement. It was a lot of fun. It was kinetic energy down there on Wall Street. Our next speaker is Ryan Shapiro. He is, <laughs> he is a longtime animal rights activist. Some highlights of his activist career include co-founding the New York City Animal Defense League in 1996, organizing a takeover of the president of NYU's office in 1997 to successfully shut down a primate research lab. <laughs> Coordinating a successful campaign to ban cetacean captivity on the island of Maui in 2000, sabotaging the macaw whale hunt in Washington state that same year, and openly rescuing ducks from foie gras factory farms in New York Now, he did that in two years, 2002 and 2003. Today, Ryan is a PhD candidate in the program in science, technology, and society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, his research explores the use of the rhetoric and app apparatus of national security to marginalize animal protectionists as threats to American security from the late 19th century to the present. Wow, I didn't know it was going on for that long. As part of this work, Ryan has roughly 500 Freedom of Information Act requests in motion with the FBI, 70 of which he's currently suing the FBI over. Ryan is also one of the plaintiffs in the federal lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. <laughs> Please welcome Ryan Shapiro. <laughs> Thank you, Odette. <laughs> thank you, Alex and Michael, and thank uh, everyone here. Let's, all right, hold on one second. I know, right? That's not my program. All right. So, as part of my lawsuit against the FBI for its failure to comply with the Freedom of Information Act, I've recently obtained some documents demonstrating FBI investigations here at the National Animal Rights Conference uh, over the years. Um, and so now let's just take a look at a few of those documents, ask a couple questions about them, and you know, think briefly about what sort of lessons we might draw uh, from those documents. All right, getting started. How did the FBI first learn about the Animal Rights Conference? Well, it was during a review of the, quote, militant animal rights internet website envirolink.org. <laughs> So, in between information about Earth Day and hydroponic uh, gardening equipment, the FBI, the FBI saw the announcement for Animal Rights 2000. Okay, so they see the announcement for the conference, but how do they decide that this conference must be really dangerous, really in need of investigating? It was information obtained from the websites of the notorious animal industry front groups, the Foundation for Biomedical Research, and Americans for Medical Progress. And their websites indicated that, quote, several animal rights activists were arrested at a similar conference a few years earlier. So what does the FBI do with this uh, at, a, at a protest outside of McDonald's? So what does the FBI do with this blockbuster information that a few animal rights activists had been arrested a few years earlier at a protest outside of McDonald's? Well, the first thing that they did was notify McDonald's that the animal rights activists were coming back to town. <laughs> And then the FBI upped their investigative game and actually looked at the website for the conference itself. 
And they spent some time on the site, and they, they spent a lot of time with the speakers list. They even made an annotated uh, memo pertaining to many of the speakers who were scheduled uh, uh, to present at the conference. And then the FBI distributed uh, this, this memo about the speakers at AR. Uh, to all of its many field offices around the country. Here we can see that it was sent out, quote, to provide recipients with information on various individuals listed as speakers at the above captioned conference, the Animal Rights 2000 conference. Um, so what happens next? Well, uh, FBI agents from all these field offices descend on Washington to investigate the conference. Here we can see that FBI headquarters has requested that all field offices send sources to attend the Animal Rights Conference. You can see I'm skipping between years a little here with the documents. The documents are just so similar between the years that it, that it makes sense. So here we have FBI headquarters asking that all field offices send uh, agents to the Animal Rights Conference at the Hilton Hotel in McLean, uh, Virginia. And the, that same document continues that the Washington field office of the FBI has tasked sources, and by sources we should read snitches. Um, so <laughs> the Washington field office tasked sources uh, to attend the conference and also to augment that coverage, the Washington field office also intends to send two joint terrorism task force members uh, to the conference as well. Right, so um, what does the FBI do, both the agents and, and their sources, uh, what do they do when they show up at the conference? Well, in some ways, they do the same things as everyone else. They register. <laughs> Here we can see that the cost of the conference was $160, but in order not to attract attention, the special agent paid in cash and received no receipt. <laughs> and they used fake names. Very tricky. <laughs> And we also see that in order to better facilitate these activities, the FBI actually rents rooms at the hotel, at the conference, uh, you know, to make it more convenient for them to, to spy on us. Uh, and spy on us, they do. FBI special agents will be videotaping the presentations of subjects currently under investigation and individuals believed to be advocating illegal activities. So everyone wave to the FBI wherever they are. There we go. <laughs> but uh, it's not just the special agents, however, that are busy, uh, hard at work here at the conference. The, the sources, the, the snitches, are, are uh, you know, out there gathering information, too. Here we can see that the FBI special agent met with a source to discuss his or her attendance. All these redactions, by the way, are the FBI's, uh, not mine. Um, so, yeah, so the special agent meets with the source to discuss his or her attendance at the Animal Rights Conference, this one, the 2004. Uh, source indicated that he or she attended conference sessions, which included observations of many of the animal rights activists. The FBI was disappointed to learn, however, that, quote, although many of the presenters supported direct action, the source did not actually note any unlawful activity or any planning of or specific suggestions of direct action during the presentations. Um, yeah, but there was one, in, one source who had a tremendous intelligence coup and was able to present to his or her FBI handlers a piece of invaluable intelligence about the movement. What did this source provide to the FBI? Josh Balk's compassion over killing business card. <laughs> which which revealed, shockingly, that Josh Balk worked for Compassion Over Killing. <laughs> uh, so, and, and this isn't the extent of the snooping. You know, the agents, thank you, the agents and, uh, and the sources, they really scoured the conference looking for anything damning, anything damaging, looking for dangerous terrorist uh, materials. And occasionally, you know, they found something like this, uh, the final nail, which is an ALF-related guide to the locations of fur farms around the country. But far more often, those dangerous terrorist materials that they were taking looked like this. <laughs> PCRM's vegetarian starter kit, meat out literature, ADL anti-fur literature, Compassion Over Killing's newsletter, and Why Vegan? So, all right, the FBI is here, right? And they are watching. I mean, we can see that. So what sort of lessons might we draw from that knowledge? One of the first things that might come to mind is, oh my God, the FBI is here. We have to be careful what we say. But I would caution against that reading of these documents. 
yes, security culture or, you know, watching what we say, it's important, very important, but it's important all the time, not just at the conference. If one truly has something one needs to be quiet about, one should be quiet about it everywhere. Uh, but that sort of thing aside, I think actually in general, at this conference, we should be as open and as welcoming as possible. It's important to remember that the FBI wants us divided. It wants us to be suspicious of each other, as revealed in documents that I've received through Freedom of Information Act request and that I've given Will and that he's written about, the FBI is explicitly interested in spreading false rumors about good activists being agents so that we don't trust them, about newcomers being snitches so that we don't let them in the movement, you know, so that we're divided, so that we can't grow as a movement. So yes, if the FBI shows up at your doorstep, shut your mouth, but, <laughs> but at this conference, we should have open arms for everyone, and honestly, if the FBI wants to hear about the horrors of factory farming, let them hear. If the FBI wants to read <laughs> vegan literature, let them read. And if the FBI wants Josh Balk's new business card to find out where he's working now, he's more than happy to give it to him. I spoke to him last night. So if suspicion isn't the lesson that we should draw from these documents, what is? I'd suggest that what these documents speak to is the true historical significance of this conference in particular and of the animal rights movement uh, more broadly. Uh, clearly, the FBI believes so. O along, these notes, uh, along these lines, as a quick aside, in my FOIA lawsuit against the FBI, the FBI just this week asked the court for a seven-year delay in processing any of my Freedom of Information Act requests because they argue, my academic research itself constitutes a threat to national security. <laughs> yes, just asking questions now about the FBI's understanding and handling of the animal rights movement is now understood as a security threat. Clearly, they are taking this movement seriously. And even more illuminative is the fact that the FBI is here at this conference every year, year after year, wasting their time, wasting their money, going through our trash. Uh, I mean, it really just speaks to how seriously they take us, how truly significant we are. And in this context, I think it's important to remember that the FBI first became especially interested in investigating this conference based on information provided by the animal industry groups, the AMP, FBR. These groups know better than anyone just how important we truly are. These groups know better than anyone what kind of a threat we truly pose a threat to their bottom lines, to their abilities to do business as usual, their ability to continue torturing animals for profit. These groups are running scared, and they're running to the FBI. That's what the FBI is doing here. So if there's a lesson to be learned from these documents, I think it's this. Let's live up to how important the FBI and the animal abuse industries believe us to be. Let's live up to how threatening they fear we can become not in terms of some animal rights terrorist boogeyman that they've concocted, but as a powerful social movement advocating for justice, compassion, and liberation for all sentient beings. If there's a lesson to be gained from these documents, it's that we need to be as united, dedicated, and effective, and effective as our opponents dread. Let's use the presence here of the FBI as a reminder to get out there and truly kick ass for animals. <laughs> Because honestly, if they want to watch, let's give them something to watch. Thank you.